Al, I asked you not to do such a great job right before my speech. <laughs> that is a tough act to follow. And uh, perhaps Professor Ravel would say that the reason that Uganda and many countries in sub-Saharan Africa are littered with water wells that don't work is because of climate change. And these water wells are funded by very well-meaning philanthropists and well-intentioned engineers. And we thought we could do it differently. Forget the good intentions and instead replace them with wise incentives. We provided unique financing with debt capital to an organization called Impact Water. And we incentivized them not just to make sure that the water wells were working, but also to ensure that the schools they were providing them to actually educated the children about proper sanitation and hygiene. Because we know that equity, after all, is not a problem of hardware, but it's a crisis of understanding and behaviors. So as the attendance rate went up in the schools, which is a strong indication of how healthy the kids were, then the interest rate on the loan would come down. And if the water organization achieved agreed-upon targets, then Rockefeller Foundation would kick in a bonus to the water company. So why am I telling you this story? Because impact investing can do things that philanthropy alone could never do. It can reward courage. It can inspire leaders to reach, not just for the low-hanging fruit, but for that fruit that seems just out of reach, that's tragically too often left to rot on the vine. And we live in a world, as we just heard from Vice President Gore, where safe things shouldn't be acceptable. And those whose lives we seek to improve don't have the luxury of waiting for change either. So we have to accelerate the evolution of our space. And while I am not, which you are about to hear, an evolutionary biologist, I do imagine one sunny day about 400 million years ago, when a fish swam to shore, looked at the beach, and said, why not? And just kept going. Suddenly, the vastness of the primordial soup was not the limit of that fish's domain. Friends, you here in the room are the fish that walks. I've worked in social change, in government, in the financial industry, and in philanthropy for many decades now. And me and my colleagues have worked on some of the most tragic and intractable issues imaginable, HIV AIDS, human trafficking, sexual exploitation of children, and I believe we've had a lot of successes, and we've eased quite a lot of suffering as well. But when I lie in bed at night, I don't feel a sense of satisfaction. I feel a sense of urgency. The scale of the problem and the rift between rich and poor expand daily. And I ask myself this question, how can I be part of the efforts that don't reward the safe thing, but instead incentivize the brave thing? How can I swim to the edge of the shore, not knowing whether or not my, there'll be enough air for my little fish gills or if my little flipper fins will be able to support my clearly not built for walking body? The times we're living in are too perilous for those of us with privilege and power to play it safe. We've got to be the catalyst for courage, not in just how we inspire, but in how we build investments. And as an impact investor, the privilege isn't lost on me. I lead the UBS Optimist Foundation, and I'm paid by a large Swiss conservative financial institution to focus on investing wisely for the most marginalized in society. And many of you in this room share that same privilege. And one of the tools that we've heard about these past couple of days from Ronnie and others is around social impact bonds and how that can be a tool for change 
particularly in government spending. And we wanted to take the lessons learned from social impact bonds and apply them to the global south, where governments, for a variety of reasons, weren't necessarily able to be a financial partner in these structures. We were approached by an organization here in India, Educate Girls, to see if we wanted to be part of the first ever development impact bond in history. Now, there's so much jargon in this space, so let me break it down for you. A development impact bond is neither a bond nor always focused on development. But it is focused on impact. And there are three core players in a development impact bond. In this one, the investor was UBS Optimus Foundation. And we were investing in a, in a service provider, Educate Girls, to deliver very specific agreed-upon targets. And I'll get back to those targets in a minute because they play a critical role in how well this structure works. And the outcome funder, in this case, was the Children's Investment Fund Foundation. And they paid us back if and only if we achieved the targets that were set at the beginning. And there's two other key players. There's the evaluator, which provides third-party evidence of whether or not the goals were achieved. And there's a big coordinator, I like to call them the circus ringleader, who really manages the whole thing. The important part of this is that Everybody involved in the development impact bond, like a social impact bond, has to agree upon these targets. And this was something new. It was unprecedented. We didn't have a lot of data to rely on when we were coming up with ours. But we had a hunch, a sneaking suspicion, that this thing would live or die based on these targets. So how long do you think it took us to come up with these targets? Keep in mind now, we've got people from five different organizations. We've got lawyers in the room, educators. We have lots of MBAs and fancy college degrees, uh, evaluators, finance experts, and uh, don't quote me, but I'm pretty sure there was even a butcher, a baker, and a candlestick maker in there somewhere. It took us 10 months to come up with the target outcomes and 18 months to birth this thing. Why? Well, it wasn't because we were all difficult, maybe present company excluded, but it was because we were uncompromising when it came to courage. We wanted to incentivize the right thing, not the achievable thing, not the safe thing, not, but the brave thing. So we decided that after three years, we wanted the following outcomes. We wanted to get three quarters of all of the el eligible out-of-school girls in the Bilvara district of Rajasthan into school, and we wanted to improve learning outcomes by 75% better than a control group. Now, here's the really interesting part of all of this. Because we were looking at the aggregate learning outcomes, if Educate Girls wanted to reach their target, it meant that they couldn't just recruit the girls who lived close to the school, those girls who went in and out of school, they had to go out. They had to go way out. They had to find girls who had never stepped foot in a classroom. They had to be brave and inexhaustible in educating the girls who were forgotten by so many traditional programs before them because these girls were simply too hard to reach. These were the girls who would achieve the greatest change in learning outcomes. So the structure of these outcomes actually created the incentive to get educate girls to focus on the most vulnerable in society, the girls who had never been reached before. And it was their portraits and their potential, which were the ones that came to our minds as we imagined the potential that we could accomplish with this collaboration. So what happened? Perhaps we were unaware of it at the time, but our need to go beyond the comfortable drove us to take our first steps with our little fins. The first year was a bit worrisome. We were behind targets. The second year, also, we were still behind targets, although getting better. But at this point, I'm now losing a few nights of sleep, and I'm thinking, 75% better than a control group at a marginal cost of roughly $20 per girl? What the hell were we thinking? 
So I'm thinking we are not going to achieve these goals. But by June of this year, this pilot was set to end, and we sat on the edge of our seats wondering if we were going to achieve the targets, if they would be confirmed by the external evaluator. Safina Hussein and her team from Educate Girls and Maya Tisvieler and her team from UBS Optimist Foundation had dedicated the last four years of their lives to this thing. So they cared a lot about it. So what were the final results of this education dip? The targets were exceeded. Educate Girls achieved 160% of the learning targets. And... It was a phenomenal accomplishment, and they got more than 90% of the out-of-school girls into school in Bilvari. That meant that we got an internal rate of return of 15%, which was great, but most importantly, it meant a lot to these 7,300 girls whose lives had been permanently changed through this pilot, and also to the dozens of people who worked on this, and not only that, but to all of us in this room. For those of us who get goosebumps at the thought of using our financial prowess to make lasting change. What we learned through this pilot is that there's reason to believe that we can make smart financial investments that also incentivize unprecedented bravery. We don't have to play it safe, and we shouldn't, if we want to see dramatic and exponential change. Courage like laughter, fear, and the common cold is contagious. And it's a lot easier to be courageous when you're surrounded by other people who are courageous. Look around you. Vice President Al Gore, who shook the foundations of our fossil fuel-based economy. And next to him, Sir Ronald Cohn, who's done so much to influence the impact investing space and is now launching two $1 billion funds, outcome funds for education. And my staff here, we've launched three development impact bonds now, all of them here in India. And the last one, with great partners like the Tata Trust, British Asia Trust, Michael and Susan Dell Foundation, and DFID. And that one was substantially larger than our first one. And we expect these to grow even more. There is so much potential to do more in this space. So be inspired, be bold, be the fish who dared to walk. Thank you.